Daniel chapter 4 The Ritual Centre of the Earth The Tower of Babel was an affirmation of the concept of continuity and an attempt, through societal and state unification and a programme of self-righteousness, to reach up to heaven to strengthen its continuity with heavenly powers by participation in the work of world redemption. It is not the, quote, evil, end quote, of, quote, sins of the flesh, end quote, which characterise the Tower of Babel and the continuing city of Babylon, the great mother of harlots, Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, but its status as a rival righteousness and a rival concept of unity and redemption. By their architecture, the Babylonian ziggurats, ladders to heaven, affirmed the concept of continuity. And all such tower faiths, stone by stone, step by step, story by story, degree by degree, man reaches up to heaven and makes the kingdom of man the goal and reality of history. The, quote, centre concept, end quote, was closely related to the stream. The square and cube, ancient symbols of perfection, completeness and full communion, became vital symbols of the true city of man, of Babylon the Great. Akhenaton built a city on a square plan, and according to Herodotus, Babylon was also a square. The same concept was apparent also in the writings of some Greek thinkers. The centre, throne and sanctuary, were related and basically the same concepts, in that the concept of continuity identified gods, states and man, and saw them as existing in one society celebrated in a ritual focus. Both Jerusalem and Gerizim were regarded by some Jews and some Samaritans in similar terms. John chapter 4 verse 20, so that the pagan concept of the ritual centre was apparently to be found in Israel as well, not only in Jeremiah's day, but in Christ's time also. Against all this, the New Testament affirmed emphatically, as did the Old, Psalm 87, etc., that the true centre is not in man, nor in his kingdom or city, but in Christ and his new Jerusalem, a city built foursquare, a perfect cube, with the throne of God and of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, as the fountainhead of all things. By reserving the throne to God and the Lamb, rather than to the Lamb as such, the ontological trinity is brought into central focus, and not God only as revealed and related to creation. As the Alpha and Omega, this Christ is also seen as beyond creation and discontinuous with it while incarnated without confusion of natures. This concept of the true centre has been set forth in the design of the tabernacle. The Holy of Holies was a cube. The camp of Israel, the assembly and church of God, was a square, as Numbers chapter 2 makes clear, with a tabernacle or throne of God in the centre. This pattern, given by Revelation on the mountain, Exodus chapter 25 verse 9 and verse 40, Numbers chapter 8 verse 4, Ezekiel chapter 43 verse 10, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, was designed both to affirm and set forth the true and transcendent centre, throne and sanctuary, and to attack all purely immanentistic concepts thereof. The Babylonian concept of continuity was clearly set forth in the form of investiture of Chaldean kings, which was, in essence, taking the hand of the god, a ritual observed from time immemorial and observed also by the Assyrians at Nineveh and by its conquerors, that is, Sennacherib, Ezerhaddon and Ashurbanipal in Babylon. Cyrus, on conquering Babylon, became king in the eyes of the Babylonians only after taking the hand of the god at his aglia. By this ritual, the empire, in the person of the king, assumed fellowship on the basis of a common life with the gods. A further symbol set forth the nature of the continuity in animate form, the tree or, quote, pole, end quote, as the ritual centre of the earth. This sacred tree or column supports heaven and is a tree of life and the bond between heaven and earth. Because this tree is a living thing, it is therefore a growing bond that this tree of life sets forth, a concept in marked hostility to the fence tree of biblical revelation. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. Again, the shepherd concept of kingship asserted the divine authority and power of the monarch, 
who, as guardian of his people, controlled their destiny which was inseparable from their life as subjects of the state. Against all this, Jehovah, God the Father, and Jesus Christ, God the Son, are asserted to be the Good Shepherd. Psalm 23, John chapter 10 verse 11, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25, and the wisdom or logos, Christ is the true tree of life. Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, chapter 3 verse 22, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 18, chapter 11 verse 30, Ezekiel chapter 47 verse 7 and 12, Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, chapter 22 verses 2 and 14. For Nebuchadnezzar, however, it was natural and inevitable in terms of the concept of continuity to dream of himself as a tree of life for his generation. But however, quote-unquote, natural the conception was to Nebuchadnezzar as a Chaldean monarch, he was also a creature of God, and in terms of that fact, his faith was unnatural and a sin. Cultural conditioning is real, but basic to man's every state is a fact of his creaturehood and his creation in the image of God. This prior and ultimate reality cannot be effaced by the conditions of history or the tyranny of man and his philosophies. Thus, in every age, men are without excuse in that they have willfully exchanged the truth of God for a lie, Romans chapter 1 verse 25, and submitted to the common and democratic lie in preference to the unpopular word of God. In such circumstances, God frequently uses man's crutches to witness against him, confounding him by his very mainstays. According to Deodorus, the Chaldeans explain dreams as portents, interpreting them in terms of rules as hard and fixed as Freudian symbols, and we find them often recorded as important items of state. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as Daniel observed with distress, be to them that hate thee, that is, is for them, and will please them that hate thee. Chapter 4, verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar saw himself as a tree in the midst of the earth, that is, the ritual centre in the tree of life, and the height thereof was great. Chapter 4, verse 10. The tree was meat for all. Chapter 4, verse 12. Support and sustenance for his generation, so that Nebuchadnezzar represented the principle of life for his time the tree of God, in whom the power and presence of God was manifested. The dream, however, saw a watcher and a holy one, chapter 4, verse 13, descend from heaven and pronounce a divine decree of hewing against the tree, with only a stump to be left as a source of new growth. A beast's heart would replace his human heart, that is, he would be as an animal, till seven times pass over him, chapter 4, verse 16 until the fullness of the decree be established. The declaration to Nebuchadnezzar was even more explicit. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Chapter 4, verse 17. This dream was seen by Nebuchadnezzar in its cultural context, but the absolute thrust was paramount. Daniel made clear also the source of the decree, not of the watchers, but of the Most High. Chapter 4, verse 24, a sentence of humbling, unless Nebuchadnezzar break off his sins by righteousness and iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Chapter 4, verse 27, There is no reason to doubt that, in the twelve months, chapter 4, verse 29, before the sentence fell, Nebuchadnezzar tried to do that very thing. The only supposed portrait of him, a cameo now in the Berlin Museum, indicates an earnest and sensitive countenance. In terms of his Chaldean concepts, he sought to be that righteous king, had always sought to be, and now more so than ever. The Gottfend inscription indicates his self-evaluation. Nebuchadnezzar, the just king, the faithful shepherd, who directs mankind, who rules over the subjects of Baal, Shamash and Marduk, the arbiter, the possessor of wisdom who cares for life, the lofty one, the untiring one, the maintainer of Asaglia and Azida, the son of Nabopolassar, king of Babylon am I. 
Nebuchadnezzar then wrote of his reverence for his creator, Marduk, the richness of his sacrifices, and the unification of numerous peoples under Babylon. Under its enduring protection I gathered together all mankind in comfort and stored up their great heaps of grain beyond reckoning. Nebuchadnezzar saw himself as the faithful shepherd, in the Winkler inscription, the legitimate shepherd, the divine king whose love of the creator God had begun at birth. He had succeeded in furthering the great kingdom of God's and man's dreams by bringing numerous peoples into unity in a common empire, one dedicated to righteousness and peace. In the Borsippa inscription, there is an earnest plea to the Eternal Son, Exalted Messenger, Nabu. Do thou proclaim the length of my days? Do thou write my offspring? In the presence of Marduk, the King of heaven and earth, the Father, my begetter, look with favour upon my works. Command that I receive favour. May Nebuchadnezzar, the King, the Restorer, be ever established in thy mouth. In another inscription, Nebuchadnezzar prayed, Truly answer me, in judgment and in dreams. By his very dependence on Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar gave evidence of the intensity of his desire to be righteous, but his conception of this was entirely in Chaldean terms. The ladder-like structure of the ziggurats, with each story recessed successively, gave from a distance the appearance of a gigantic ladder reaching up towards heaven, a fitting symbol of this religion of continuity and its belief in the bond of heaven and earth. The humility of Nebuchadnezzar was real, but it was not godly, being set in the context of one who took the hand of the god for its people in awed humility and pride at his function as centre, throne, tree, shepherd, column and glory. In this concept, God was involved in a dialectic of history and not beyond it, and the point of involvement was Nebuchadnezzar and his empire. Accordingly, Nebuchadnezzar, in terms of his faith, spoke honestly and with some odd humility as well as pride in affirming, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty? Chapter 4, verse 30 This is not to be construed as merely vainglorious boasting, but rather as the happy and proud summarisation of a man who rejoices in his work in righteousness, affirming that his order is indeed a fulfilment of the kingdom and the true ritual centre of the earth, the human focus of the divine glory. The statement is thus an affirmation of his satisfaction that the threats of the dream has been stayed, that the dream, recorded no doubt in the archives of state, as other dreams were, had been stayed by the human righteousness of the king and his order. It was the consummate expression of self-righteousness, the accentuation of that very faith which God was challenging. It is thus precisely at the moment that Nebuchadnezzar believed the kingdom to be securely established that the sentence came. The kingdom is departed from thee. Chapter 4, verse 31 Moreover, wherever man seeks to be more than man, he becomes less than man. His every attempt to be as God results in a reduction of his manhood and a retreat into unreason and irresponsibility. In Nebuchadnezzar, the ostensible tree of life, this metamorphosis manifested itself as what has been termed both lycanthropy and, more properly, zoanthropy, an ailment in which man, hating God and therefore himself also, as created in the image of God, tries to strike at God by trying to efface every trace of his own humanity and the divine image in himself. There is some evidence that Nebuchadnezzar was completely absent from power for four years. The purpose of the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar had been that he know the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Chapter 4 verse 25 There is good reason to believe that Nebuchadnezzar's experience culminated in his regeneration. Although his proclamation is in part couched in polytheistic terms, it is significant that such references appear in his description of his thinking prior to his recovery. Certainly the document is remarkable as compared to other documents of antiquity in its humility and confession of sin. The statement asserts three things. One, the absolute sovereignty and discontinuity with man of God. 
chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, and verse 37. 2. The entire proclamation is a declaration of repentance, and 3. is a confession of sin. Much less is asked of many a modern, quote, convert, end quote, and to hesitate with regard to Nebuchadnezzar's integrity of faith seems unjustified. Moreover, even as Job's latter days were blessed more than his former, Job chapter 42, verses 10 to 13, so Nebuchadnezzar was strengthened in his kingdom, and excellent majesty was added, chapter 4, verse 36, to him. The significance of Nebuchadnezzar's entire attitude has been overlooked, but is of no small importance. Even granting to the dubious that the monarch never became a true worshipper, the fact still remains that his signal preference for Daniel and his associates, and for their faith, gave to the Hebrews a privileged position in that empire. This was sufficient to create an anti hebraic sentiment among jealous Chaldeans, both then, chapter 3, verse 8, and later, chapter 6, verse 4, under Darius. The position of the Hebrews was thus one of security, privilege and prosperity, so that their captivity became not a curse, but a protection. They were under a king whose attitude towards God, even with a minimum interpretation, compared favourably with that of the kings of Judah. And if, as young Abley argues, his faith was now genuine, their situation was markedly better. Thus, even in the harshness of captivity, the grace, protection and blessing of God was openly manifested.